Um, but today I'm, I'm going to be talking about um, more about development and uh, in particular a study um, that we used uh, something called trajectory analysis um, or developmental trajectory analysis uh, to understand or to look at uh, the different causes that um, allow children or cause children to be able to analogically reason as they, as they develop. So the background to this is that uh, there's quite a bit of work showing that there's lots of different causes for the development of analogical reasoning. Um, and trajectory analysis is an interesting approach that allows you to um, consider all of these and, and, and look at how they might um, predict development at different stages. So, um, so this is going to be, hang on a sec. So I'm going to, first of all, just make a, a say a few things about analogy in, in cognition and development. Um, talk a little bit about this, uh, this method, cross-sectional cross -sectional trajectory analysis, and then describe a study of uh, the development of analogical reasoning across the ages of four to eight years old. So, so I'm not going to go into too much depth about um, what analogy is. Um, this is a pretty analogy savvy crowd, apart from you know, define it as a relational similarity. So seeing that um, different experiences, different representations um, have the same relational structure where objects um, share the same kind of relational role and there are these kind of abstract relationships between them. So there's a, there's a bird and a, a feeding its, its chick here, um, which shares the same role as a parent feeding their, their human baby. And this ability to see similarity across these uh, uh, relational similarity um, is often said to be you know, the core of cognition, but um, a lot of people might say it's also the core of, of development as well. So once you're able to see how things are similar by, by relation, you can transfer information from one to the other. So on the left here, there's a, a remote control with, and it's got some batteries inside it and the batteries cause the remote control to, to function. And so if you're learning about um, biological cells, you might learn that biological cells also have components in them called organelles um, and they have different functions. So by using analogy, you can say things like, well, well, mitochondria, they're like the batteries of a remote con uh, of the cell. And you can transfer um, these relations and use them as some kind of conceptual scaffold to create new conceptual structure. So it's a really uh, key mechanism in, in, in how we uh, develop new concepts, new understanding of the world. Um, and like most uh, sophisticated human abilities, children are just, they're not, they're not very good at it. Uh, and it takes a while for them to develop. So what changes in development? Well, the way that development is usually studied is with these kind of analogy problems. So this is, I'm just gonna get my pointer up, hang on. Pointer options. So this is a, a proportional analogy problem where you've got a base, uh, which is formed of an A and a B term. And children have to understand this abstract relationship between the A and the B term and find something that goes with the C term using the same relation. And there are various kinds of problems, so you can um, there are kind of uh, sort of language problems and games, but I'm just going to focus on this A, B, C, D uh, problem for now because this is what I'm going to use in, in the study. And so when you give children these kind of problems, they start becoming uh, above a chance at solving these problems around the ages of three to five, um, dependent on the uh, items used, the kind of scaffolding that's given, um, and various other factors. And of course, children have individual differences as well. And however, they make many mistakes in these problems. So children are really drawn to making these kind of object matches, which are similar to um, the, C, the C term or errors that are associated to the C term, but it's the wrong kind of relation. So in this problem here, um, it's uh, what goes with the uh, drink in the same way as the bucket goes with the sand. Well, the sand goes into the bucket and the drink goes into uh, the glass. Um, however, the ice is also uh, associated and children struggle sometimes when there are these kind of uh, semantic distractors. Um, they're also not very good at when you cross masking problems. So when an item in the base is the same as the item in the, uh, sorry, in the, in the target is the same as the item in the base, but in a different role and if you increase the complexity, 
um, children, again, they struggle with these kind of problems. So beyond the kind of age of three to five years old, children become aggressively better at reasoning with more complex kind of problems. Um, they're able to, they can solve these kind of problems without, with less external scaffolding and less kind of attentional direction. Um, so what, what, what is causing these changes? Well, um, I'm not going to go into too much detail, the, the different theories, but um, it's kind of largely agreed that there are various uh, changes that take place. The children uh, need to understand the, the conceptual, uh, uh, conceptual relationships. So there's this domain specific change in conceptual development that takes place. Um, something that's um, uh, not been discussed as much in the, in the literature recently is, is, is task knowledge. Children need to know that they need to take this base term and um, look for something that goes with the C term around all of these options they're given. So there's a sort of procedural, uh, level of procedural knowledge that's, that's necessary. And uh, more recent work has focused on the role of executive function. So children need to be able to hold uh, relations in mind while they're searching for uh, something that goes with the C term. They need to be able to suppress these competing uh, relation uh, items and uh, they need to be able to focus on uh, different aspects of the problem at different times. So they need to suppress the main goal of find something that goes with C to understand how A and B go together first. And so there's quite a bit of research now showing that all that all of these different um, changes are uh, involved in, in, in children's ability to analogically reason. However, it's not clear um, what's more important at what different times? So is, is knowledge more important when they're younger or um, is, is it more important when they're older? When, is, when are executive functions um, really key to, to, to driving development? Is, is, this, is this AB term more important than CD term and vice versa? And so this is uh, the kind of questions that I've been thinking about uh, in the study that we're gonna, gonna show now. And using this method called a uh, cross-sectional trajectory analysis. So I'll just talk a couple of things about that first of all. So cross-sectional trajectory analysis, it's a, um, it's a paradigm that's often used in developmental disorder research. And what you do in trajectory analysis is take a, uh, a sample from um, the developmental age range of interest and um, a measure is taken of the, the, the construct of interest, and then you fit functions to describe these uh, developmental trajectories that take place. Um, and you can start, so it's been useful in developmental disorder research. So, so you, you can measure uh, this increases in the particular construct in different uh, populations. So and uh, typically, de typically developing population and some kind of uh, disorder population. And then additional measures are taken to establish developmental uh, relationships between lower level constructs. So it's, for example, if we were saying this is uh, language development or vocabulary development, um, other measures might be taken for working memory or inhibitory control and, you, and these associations are drawn between a change in these lower level constructs and change in these uh, high level constructs. And so we're gonna use this method uh, to look at analogical reasoning development. So whereas in um, the developmental disorder work, it's, it's uh, used in a between participants uh, uh, arrangement. Uh, in this uh, analogy study, we're gonna look at it uh, in within participants. So take measures of, of, of children's different responses across different ages and then look at how um, changes in working memory, changes in conceptual development, how they're predicting these different traje response trajectories. So, uh, so it has um, limitations, first of all. So it's a, it does confound developmental and individual differences. However, um, the me that what we're looking at here is, it's, it's, there are well uh, known developmental changes that take place and these kind of this kind of confound between developmental and individual differences exists in, in, in real life as well. So not worrying too much about that, but it is a, associational. 
So validation is needed to kind of infer causality, but it does have several advantages over other methods. So it provides a window into the, the shape of change that's taking place. So um, whether children's responses are taking uh, continuous or um, non-linear trajectories, and it allows you to model how change in these lower level processes are predicting change in a high level process as well. So, um, that's what I'm going to describe now. So, so this is the outline of the study. So um, we sampled from 84 typically developing children in the UK um, across the ages of four to eight years old. And each of the children completed these 10 ABCD analogy problems. And in these problems, there are four possible responses. So you can make the analogical match here. There is a semantic distractor match. And then there are, there's a category match same category match, and then a, a match that has some kind of salient perceptual feature. And they're scored, each child receives a score for each of the kind of responses they make. So they might make uh, six analogical matches and three semantic errors and, and one perceptual error, for example. And the first thing you need to do is uh, fit functions to those to map out the trajectories for each of these kind of response types, and then use um, some measures of uh, conceptual development and executive control to predict changes in, in these trajectories. So the measures we're going to use as predictors, so to uh, measure working memory, we've used a list sorting uh, score, a list sorting task, and the score is calculated from the, the number of items that are correctly recalled. Uh, we're taking a measure of semantic inhibition, so the animal stroop. And the score of that is the number of items, uh, they, uh, the number of trials, correct, sorry. Um, we're also taking a rule-based inhibition, so a hearts and flowers task. And the uh, outcome measure of this is the RT difference between congruent and incongruent trials. And then we're taking a measure of conceptual change as well. So um, I'll talk a little bit more about this, this one, because uh, this is something that um, is kind of hasn't been used before, I think. So the way uh, we're going to measure conceptual change in here is to look at how much the A and B items prime each other. So how much A primes B and C primes D for all of the uh, concepts used in the analogy problems and um, the kind of theoretical background to this is um, we kind of drew on some of the conceptual, the concept literature, and in particular, these grounded and embodied views of cognition that describe um, objects as concepts as um, not separate from the relations that um, that they uh, that, that they're related to. And uh, so, the assumption here is that as children uh, associate these objects with uh, the relations that they need to use these problems to solve these problems there'll be a stronger priming effect between the objects um, and there's some evidence to support this so for example you know that uh, nouns prime verbs um, so they are so there is uh, existing evidence that this kind of priming works it's slightly different to how we're using it here the cool thing is about it is that we can measure uh, we can yoke this kind of priming task to all of the task specific concepts used in the problems as well. Um, so how, how are we going to do this? Well, the ideal way to do this would be to use a lexical decision task. However, um, we are doing this with some of the children are, are four years old and uh, they can't read. So we use a queued recall task. Um, so the queued recall task is where you give children pairs of words so um, they'd, they'd first of all hear pairs of words like peel, orange, painting, brush, tunnel, train, and so on. And then you, uh, they, you do a short distractor task with them and then ask them, what was the word I said with peel? What was the word I said with tunnel? And the assumption here is that um, if peel and orange are related to each other, then when they hear the word peel, this partially primes um, this uh, the, the target and uh, allows it to be, e uh, e makes it easier for the child to recall it. So it's uh, not a, a really, it's not a very clean measure. It's obviously relies on a working memory 
and inhibitory control, but we're going to take measures for those anyway. So just to kind of summarize, we're going to give children 10 of these problems here, um, plot trajectories for their different kind of response types, and then um, look at whether what working, how working memory, inhibitory control, and measures of the AB association strength and the CD association strength predict these. So first of all, let's have a look at the, the response trajectories. So, um, so this is uh, the plot on the left-hand side, and on the x-axis is uh, age in years, and on the y is the number of analogical responses children made, and you can see there's a sort of clear, continuous linear, linear trajectory all the way from four years to, to eight years old. Um, next, we'll have a look at the semantic associate errors. So this is these errors that are related to the C term, but it's the wrong kind of relation. And the, the trajectory isn't as, as clear in, in these uh, problems, but um, so we use different kind of functions to see if we can um, find a, a good fit. And uh, so the, the solid line is a, a linear a function and the dotted line is the quadratic function, but neither of them are, are significant. Um, however, there's lots of data there that we can use in regression models. And this is the uh, perceptual responses. So we didn't get many perceptual responses uh, in our data. And um, so we actually collapsed both of the category and perceptual responses together, partly because it's difficult to determine whether children are making a category response on its perceptual features. Um, and even, even so, we still don't find uh, many, but it's children in the, in the younger children are making these kind of responses. So the next thing we're gonna do is um, predict, look at what's causing this change or what's kind of associated with this change. So I'm gonna walk through a few regression models now. Um, the first one is we're gonna be predicting uh, change in analogical matches, a change in inc increase in analogical matches. Um, so first thing we do is put age in and then the executive function measures and then this A, B, and C, D association score. So um, there's the age, which you've already seen. But when we put executive functions in, we find that um, working memory is predicting children's increase in these uh, analogical matches. However, there's, we don't see anything to do with um, inhibition, both semantic and, and rule-based are not, not predicting anything. And this is accounting for uh, 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 a reasonable amount of variance. And next we're going to put in uh, the priming score for children's A, B terms and for C, D terms. And this, I'm just going to, what we find is that working memory is still predictive. So higher working memory is predicting uh, increase in, in analogical matches, but also um, the strength of this A, B association is uh, adding unique variants above age and, and working memory. Um, and interestingly, not, not the CD association either. So if you put CD in and not AB, it's still the same. CD is, is, is not, not predictive. Um, next, we're going to have a look at what's predicting these semantic associate errors and do the same kind of model. So start with age and uh, then put the executive functions in. So now um, lower working memory is uh, strongly predicted to, uh, um, sorry, higher working memory predicts a decrease in these kind of semantic errors. And um, this rule-based inhibition was the hearts and flowers task. So the larger the RT difference, the poorer the uh, inhibitory control. So poorer inhibitory control is, is um, associated with more uh, semantic associate responses. Um, although we didn't see anything for semantic inhibition again. Next, we're going to put in the AB terms, and um, this time uh, semantic inhibition becomes uh, significant. However, it's kind of paradoxical because this is uh, with semantic inhibition, the higher the score, the better the inhibition. And this is so higher in a semantic inhibition is predicting more semantic associate errors. So come back to that in a bit. It's kind of curious. Um, but again, uh, stronger AB terms are predicting uh, this retreat from semantic associate responses. So we didn't uh, use the regression models for the perceptual responses because it wasn't, um, it's not really, uh, the data wasn't really appropriate for it. But I'll come back to that uh, shortly. So, 
So just to summarize this so far, so um, we found that analogical matches are predicted by age, better working memory, and the strength of these AB terms here. So really highlighting the importance of having a, a, a strong base representation that you can then use to, to guide the kind of inference that you're making. Um, when it comes to the semantic associate errors, um, poor working memory predicted uh, more semantic errors, uh, poor rule-based inhibition, and uh, this paradoxical effect of greater semantic inhibition and poor AB strength. So, um, so, so that's show. Uh, uh, um, the next thing we're going to do now is is have a look at whether these kind of these these sort of, uh, different variables predict uh, change in different age groups. So, mm -hmm. the interesting thing about this method is you can split it into split the group into two. So we're going to split our sample into a lower sample of four and five year olds and then six and seven year olds. Um, so if you have a look at predictors of analogical responses split by age, um, in the younger children, so I should say that uh, this is a bit more exploratory really because uh, the, 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 the models are you know, a bit underpowered, but um, we're still finding some quite strong effects. So what's predicting analogical responses in younger children is uh, not this AB association, as is in the case uh, in the previous uh, analysis, but working memory. So what about in the older children? Well, when we put, um, in the older children, working memory is no longer uh, predictive, but it's this AB association string. So highlighting this, uh, the importance of perhaps executive functions um, and the constraints they place on children's ability to analogically reason uh, at an earlier age, whereas later on, when children's executive functions are more developed, um, this change is kind of really predicted by how strong this A B association is. Um, so let's do the same with semantic errors. Um, so we split the group into two, younger children and older children. With the younger children, um, poorer working memory is predicting more semantic errors. Poorer uh, inhibitory control is predicting more semantic errors. And there's this uh, strange paradoxical effect of the Stupa game. Um, and when we look at older children, this is a similar uh, pattern to that we saw with the uh, analogical responses where actually in any of the executive functions, they're, they're no longer predictive of change, but what's really predicting change is this AB association strength here. And I'll just show you one more um, of the perceptual errors. So um, because we split the group in two, um, we're just gonna do a regression for, for this, this half here. So um, age, uh, is, is predicting perceptual errors, this retreat. There is a, now a, a paradoxical effect for hearts and flowers. So um, poorer uh, rule-based inhibition is predicting less uh, perceptual matches, um, which is a sort of the inverse of the paradoxical effect we saw with the semantic errors. However, animal stroop um, is, is, is strongly predicting uh, children's perceptual errors. So poorer um, semantic inhibition is predicting more uh, semantic associate errors. So I think I'm probably running out of time in a bit, but I'll just talk a little bit about why these this paradoxical effect might be the, might be the case. So when I um, originally designed this study, thought that um, hearts and flowers would be predicting these perceptual errors because mm -hmm. hearts and flowers task involves holding a rule and uh, using that to then guide actions after. And we thought this is sort of analogous to being able to hold, hold the rule that you need to have a look at this AB first before going have a look at C D terms. So if you don't look at this AB first and you're just trying to match with the C term, then you're more, it's an easy route to making these kind of perceptual errors. But um, perhaps that's not the case, but perhaps uh, actually with the animal stroop, um, 
you've got to use semantic information to suppress a very salient perceptual feature. So in animal stroop, you're shown uh, different size animals and you've got to say whether it's a big or a small animal. And sometimes the big animals, are, so elephants and horses, when they're presented small, you need to suppress this salient perceptual feature, focus on the semantic information. And um, so thinking about it now, well, that's kind of analogous to suppressing these perceptual features to uh, focus on the deeper relations. So animal stroop is, uh, seems to be uh, predicting these uh, perceptual errors, whereas in um, semantic errors, it's hearts and flowers. And um, we can have a chat about why that might be in, in, in the discussion. Um, got a, a few ideas, but uh, I think I'm running out of time here. So I'll just sort of wrap up with uh, a few comments here. So, so what we found is that um, conceptual association strength, working memory and inhibitory control, well, they differentially predict analogical reasoning dependent on age. So in younger children, um, we see uh, an increase in semantic inhibition is associated with this decrease in perceptual errors. Um, whereas an increase in rule-based inhibition and working memory is associated with a decrease in semantic errors and an increase in working memory associated with increase in analogical matches. So um, one kind of interpretation of this data might be that children um, are they're semantic in, they're using semantic inhibition to suppress these perceptual features. Um, this rule-based inhibition is uh, allowing them to um, suppress these semantic associate errors. And then this increase in, in relational matches is uh, largely driven in, in the younger children by working memory. Whereas in older children, um, there was uh, executive function measures don't seem predictive at all. Um, seem in our the way that our data described uh, the situation is that uh, in younger children, executive functions are really constraining children's ability but after that change is dependent on this a on the strength of the a b representation um, and uh, but and interestingly not this the c d representation either so um i'd be interested to it's the first time i presented this to an analogy savvy crowd so it'd be really interesting to hear your thoughts on on this data and this and this method um, I'll just say uh, thank you to my supervisors, Michael Thomas and uh, Andrew Tolmy and uh, uh, the labs I'm in and uh, funding council and thank you all for listening and I'll be very happy to take any questions. Thank you.